Okay guys, this is a demonstration that I've been doing for the past few uh, weeks at various farmers markets, artist markets, even on the side of the road. A lot of this is introducing people who haven't done any wood turning before to wood turning and other forms of woodworking. And one of the key things I like to stress on this is this is something anybody can do. And you're basically going to be applying principles that you've learned everywhere else in life from elementary school through high school and specifically you guys have already worked with wood long enough to know how wood's going to react all you have to do is learn to transfer that knowledge to wood turning and it will be a really fun aspect side aspect to your hobby i hate the fact that a lot of people kind of specialize on a certain niche when whether it be working flat work or turning or intarsia or scroll saw work or just carving a lot of these things can interact and we as hobbyists like to dabble a little bit. I want to stress with y'all in this little quick demonstration uh, that wood turning is something that you can do and apply into your furniture making, other pro woodworking projects, and you're going to transfer a lot of that knowledge that you already know. So you should already have enough confidence to at least try this hobby. Okay. Now, one of the key aspects of wood turning uh, is something that you learned in elementary school. Riding the seesaws. I know they don't have seesaws anymore because the lawyers got them out of the parks, but most of us our age remember riding a seesaw. This tool right here is called a roughing gouge. And basically, it's got a deep V to it, a U to it, and a single bevel that goes all the way across. And this is the tool we use to go from basically a log or a square like I have right here to round. Roughing gouge. Uh, now, the principle for using this is the same principle you're going to use for every single other tool you use except for when you are doing a scraping cut. And I'll get to that later. But 99% of the time, you're going to be using the same technique on this tool as all your other tools. And it's something called riding the belt. Okay? Now, in kindergarten, you went out to the seesaws. You got on the seesaws. One kid goes up, one kid goes down. Okay? because the fulcrum is in the middle of the, the, the toy, uh, basically it's an even, tra even pattern. Now, as one kid comes up, if you were me, you generally hopped off this side and this kid went slamming down. Somewhat fun. Now, if you move that fulcrum out a quarter of the ways, this goes up and down, say an inch. That goes up a lot less, maybe half an inch, because you just divided that in half. If you move that fulcrum, all the way to the very edge, this one bevel right here, basically I can move this an inch and that barely moves. The cutting edge barely moves because I am pivoting off the one fulcrum. Okay? That's how you gain control with almost every tool you use. I come over to the wood, I place that bevel on the wood and I lift the back of the handle up until I get a cutting edge. Once I get that cutting edge, I just keep that angle to do the rest of the cuts. It's called riding the bevel. Now, us woodworkers know, wood turners know that once that bevel leaves the wood, that's where things get, I'm not gonna call it scary, but exciting. Because basically, once that bevel leaves the wood, the knife is going to wanna plunge into the wood, okay? So the idea is in all your turning, always leave that bevel riding the wood. It's called riding the bevel. Okay, so here we go. I have a square right here. Okay, go ahead, quickly turn it around. So just for the rough work, I'll wear a face shield. I do have plastic glasses to protect me also. So here we go. Turn it on. Now, I want you to listen. Okay, I'm going to touch the tool to the tool rest. I'm going to touch the bevel to the wood and you can hear it. I am not cutting, okay? I'm going to lift the back of the tool up until I see shaving start coming off the tool, right about there. At which point, I simply lock that angle against my ribs, keeping the edge on the tool rest. Now, you keep that tool rest at a height so that you are engaging the wood about the 50% mark. That means the power transfer is hitting the wood here and going straight down which just so happens to be where the tool rest is. So all that power is getting transferred to the ground. Pivot off the tool rest, pivot off the bevel. So you have two points of fulc two fulcrums to deal with. Easy transfer. 
something you learned in elementary school. So here we go, once again. Okay? Fuel rest. Touch the wood. Bevel engages. Lift it up until I get cutting edge. Lock it against these rock hard abs. And use your legs to keep it everything steady. Now, I want you to see what's happening, okay? The wood is getting chewed up in deep U's, okay? The chips that are coming off are going across grain and they're chips like that. Again, transferring knowledge. What tool do we use all the time to rough out and prepare rough stock that's going to go across a grain, create deep V's, and create chips like this? Simply your scrub plane the first plane you use to it and look at the blade a deep wide U and when you go across the wood cross grain it creates these valleys this is a roughing tool exact same thing as a roughing gouge okay another advantage are you riding the bevel on this one yes except the bevel is the bottom of the plane if you think about it a plane running across the wood the blade engages the blade itself wants to dive into the wood. It hits that wood, it wants to follow its angle. What's preventing that blade from diving into the wood is the sole, which acts as the bevel in wood turning that keeps the blade from diving in and pushes it across. across. So the sole of your plane acts like the bevel of your tool. Again, you are transferring your knowledge. You're not creating new knowledge. You're just applying it in a different manner. Okay? So, you never want to move your tool rest with the tool gauge. Rotate it. Make sure it doesn't hit. Okay, here we go. Rounding it out. Now, this piece of wood right here is a piece of hickory that I got, that I got uh, out of a ranch as the game tech. And that's one of the cool things about wood turning. Whereas us flywood workers, furniture makers, cabinet makers and stuff, we end up spending a lot of money on our tools, table saws, or hand saws, planes, joiners, that kind of stuff. Uh, but you really don't have to. If you're like me, you can get away with $150, $200 worth of hand tools and make pretty much everything in your house. Right? I don't spend much money on my tools, but I do have to buy the wood. For a wood turner, you have a little bit of a financial investment right off the get-go, but once you get the tools, the lathes, a few hand tools and stuff like that, you really don't have to invest much more into it because the wood's free. The wood turners don't have to buy their lumber. A tree falls over in the neighborhood or out on the back 40. You take a saw over there, chop it up, dry it yourself, rough it out. This, right, this tree right here probably fell maybe a month ago. I was out there two weeks ago cutting up with a chainsaw. Uh, it is cool enough that I can feel a temperature change right here. It's actually fairly cool. And if you watch as I cut it, you're going to see the wood changes color because I'm exposing fresh moisture and that moisture evaporates a little bit all right off the surface and dries out a little bit. It's kind of like when you put alcohol on wood. It gets a little darker. Watch as I turn. You can actually see the moisture evaporating off of it. That's how green this wood is. And wood turners can use that kind of wood. Okay, I'm going to reposition my tool rest a little closer. Again, the closer to the tool rest, the power is getting transferred here. I don't have to deal with much. If the fulcrum was right here, that was an equal effort down here, the leverage would be on my wrist. But since the leverage is way up here, I don't have to do much. Another principle you learned in your science class. Okay, here we go. It's getting close to rough and I'm having a hard time speaking with y'all, so I'm going to take this off. Again, I still have my safety glasses on. Okay, let's rough this out. Now, just like your, skew, uh, your scrub plane, getting this particular tool ultra sharp is not that critical. Its only job is to rough out as much wood as possible. You want to see something kind of cool? 
This little mini jet I have right here has a one horsepower engine, okay? Do these arms right here look like they have one horsepower power in them? No. But I can actually bog down a one horsepower motor with just my hands by using that leverage aspect. Because the tool rest is so far forward, it's kind of like using a jack to lift up a car. You can eventually get that car up because you have all the leverage. I have all the leverage right here and I can actually bog down a one horsepower motor with just my little tool. So here we go, bog this thing down. And I don't know if you notice this, I'm basically keeping my thumb on the tool rest to press it down. That's all the pressure I have. And the back, I've only got a few fingers on. Okay, it's locked against my rock hard abs to keep it steady. But this is not a muscle activity. Anybody can do it. It's more finesse. And then when you want to dive in to increase, take more wood off, you just lift up to increase that angle that the blade is engaging. Okay, never move your tool rest with the wood moving. And we are almost to the round. And once you get to the round, that's when you get to start having fun. Okay, what I'm doing right now is a form of turning called spindle turning. The tree grows this way. I'm always going with the grain. The other forms of turning involve end grain turning where you've kind of got it locked in as a spindle but you're going in through the end grain turning. That's like when you create hollow forms and bases and such like that. The other form is bowl turning. And what's unique about bowl turning is you're going both with and against the grain twice at every single revolution of the wood. So you have some special tools to deal with that kind of stuff, uh, bowl gouges. But the principles you learn with spindle gouges of riding that bevel are always applied to the as, to the project. Okay, let's see if we got it round. Okay, if I let the tool rest on top, the fact that it's not bouncing that much means I got it round. Okay, so here we go. Once we got it round, we can start having fun. My favorite tool in turning is the skew. A lot of people are scared of the skew, uh, but there's really no reason I don't believe. Let me raise the tool rest up a little bit because I like coming down on top a little bit more when I work the skew. Personal preference. Okay. Now I did a video on the skew chisels a while back, and I, I in the video I told people I had problems with this style of skew chisel, which Alan Lacer developed, where you got much of a straight on the top and a curve on the side, straight on the top, curve on the side, simply because I couldn't figure out how to sharpen it. But that's one of those things that it wasn't I couldn't use it very hard. I didn't have the knowledge at the time. Alan Lacer actually showed me you don't you sharpen it on the grinder. You come over here, you grab your little diamond wheel to sharpen. You just sharpen it right here. Fairly simple. Kind of like we as wood, hand tool woodworkers would use a stroke to sharpen our chisels all the time. Just rub it down the leather. Same principle here and it works much better that way. Once I figured out how to sharpen it, I this is my favorite tool. And let me show you why. I can You can have basically six bevels on this tool. I have two on the top, two on the bottom, and two long ones on the side. So I can ride that bevel this way and lift up. I can ride the bevel this way, lift up, this way, lift up, or on either side. So you have a lot of flexibility. This is the main tool that people that are making chair rail banisters or legs for, uh, uh, what's that chair that Mr. Schwartz just made, the Rorker chair. All those can be done with a skew chisel. This is the main spindle turning tool, okay? And this is why. You can do a lot with it fast. Okay, here we go. I'm going to make a quick mark. Just from my knowledge. Go crank up the speed a little bit. Okay, remember, I ride the bevel, I lift up on the bevel. That bevel will always be cutting the wood. And then I can control how much wood I take off by the angle of the back. So I'll dive in. As long as that bevel stays on the wood, I have ultimate control and I let physics handle all the effort. So here we go. Okay, 
What did I do? Touch the bevel down. I lift up until I see a little bit of shavings coming across. Making sure I keep the tool on the tool rest and the bevel on the wood, I push in and towards the center. Now, let me stop this real quickly and let's take a look at the shavings that I'm getting off of this. Okay? The nice, long, straight shavings. Okay? Versus the chips I was getting off with the roughing gouge. Now, just based on the shavings, what kind of tool do you think that's like? How about your planes? Okay, you're going with the grain, taking nice smooth shavings. Okay, uh, now a lot of the same principles with this tool apply with tools like your school chisel. Look at this. I have a bevel on bottom, and the plane is at a 45 degree angle on this one. Other planes are going to go up 50, 50 to 55 to control tear out and that kind of stuff. So planes are adjustable for the reaction they have to the wood so that we get the proper effect that we want. Well, I got a skew chisel here. It too has a plain bottom that's referred to the bevel. It too has angles, except this time instead of the angles being fixed, my angles are controlled my angles are controlled by how I present to the wood. So if I present the tool right like this, I have a fairly steep angle. The wood's coming straight on. This is the angle I do. And I have that curve right there on this particular tool because wherever I touch that tool has a different angle to it. So on really hard hardwoods, I might engage the curve up a little bit higher to increase my angle. And how's that working, you say? Well. I go back to the movie days. Uh, you're skiing, okay? The standard rule we learned for skiing in the movies is if you go, you go straight down the hill and if something gets in your way, turn. Now, if you go straight down a mountain, you can pick up speed really fast because basically the slope, the angle you're doing is going st almost straight down. Now, if we want to slow down, what do we do? We turn. So we go to angle. Now the mountain's slope stayed the same. The angle stayed the same, but because we are going across it at different angle, our angle relative to the mountain changes. Well, on a hand plane, we can do the same exact thing. We come across at this, t this going straight across the wood. I'm at the angle set by the bed of my plane. If I skew it and approach it, all of a sudden I can decrease the angle because the wood is coming off the blade at a sideways. Just like going skiing, you decrease the angle of the mountain by going across it. Now, if you have somebody chasing you, asking for $2, go straight down. Get higher angle, increase speed. Okay, so here we go. Keep working at this. why I like to skew so much. At one aspect, I just waste away a whole bunch of wood really fast. Okay. There we go. Nice long shavings, just like off a hand plane. Really thin shavings. You can see through these because I controlled how I was going into the wood. If I really dove in, the blade would dive into the wood, take a deep, deep shaving until the bevel touched down and pushed back. And that would keep a consistent shaving all the way around. I just controlled how the bevel and the blade touched to get my nicer, thin shavings. Now, right now it's fairly rough because I took off a lot of wood quick. So let me increase the speed a little and I'm gonna smooth it out. And if you notice, how the wood is coming off the blade. I am basically presenting the blade at a 45 degree angle to the wood, 
just like with hand planks. And if you look at the shavings I get off, they're nice curly cues. Okay? Just like a hand plane skewed at an angle will produce that kind of curly cue. Again, we are transferring knowledge. We don't have to learn new stuff. We just transfer what we currently know. Get a little farther down. Now, wood turning is kind of fun because it is so fast. And I like to call it uh, the woodworking for those with attention deficit disorder because you can finish a project really fast. Just walk out in the garage pick up a piece of firewood and in you know 20 minutes you've done something it might not be the most perfect thing in the world oh that was just a catch because the blade touched and I didn't have a bevel on so it just pushed out of the way it was oh big and scary I almost overlooked it okay so that's what you well, that's what's happened when the blade the bevel was not touching the wood so I'm just going to clean that up real quickly and what's a catch look like see you see the blade dug in and because the bevel wasn't there to push back it took off on its own it followed the angle of the blade no big deal We're not overly scary so I'll just remove that I use a different tool I'll clean it up okay so in case you haven't haven't been able to tell, I'm making a woodworking mallet. Okay, so I like that. So now I'm going to switch to another tool. My third tool so far. Okay, this is called a spindle gouge. And this gives you the artistic control in spindle turning. If you notice the difference between a spindle gouge and the roughing gouge. The spindle gouge has a curve along the top versus a roughing gouge which is straight across the top okay now this gives me control the roughing gouge basically I only have the one bevel I can go straight across now with this I can create roundovers or coves that's basically what it does roundovers and coves because the bevel is so short on this it's kind of like having a shorter plane a number two or a number three it tends to come in and out so it's not as good for round uh, making long sweeping straight lines so here we go I touch it down you can hear it I'm on the wood it is not cutting I lift up on the back so I get cutting edge and then I roll it over okay locking against the body now my objective on this tool is because it is curved if I want to go this way I want to stay on this side of the curve if I'm going this way, I want to stay on that side of the curve. And from there, it's just how I adjust where the bevel is touching versus the tip as to whether or not I create a cove or a bead. So here we go. If you want to make something like an egg, you just round it over and you move the tip over a little bit. And I'm not going to make a perfect egg, it's just for a demonstration purpose. But this would be like on a chair rail banister or the end of a baseball bat. You can round it out. Here's something kind of cool. I sharpened these with my little 1200 grit diamond stone. And in wood turning, basically, if you sharpen your tools to 1200 grit, it's like sanding at that. So you can have a glass smooth finish without having to sand too much. Okay? So, with this tool, touch it down and roll, lift on the back, and come over, and you can round things over. Now, if I want to create a cove, make a bead, I did this action. I lift it and round. If I'm going to make a cove, I'm going to kind of push in and come out. Exactly opposite. So here we go, making a cove. Okay, I am going to lower my tool rest a little bit. Again, personal preference. Here we go. Dive in and scoop my way out. Now 
wound up, I try and slow down. Can you see that's coming off below the center point? It's coming off at about 45 degrees as the wood is presented to the tool. Now this piece of wood is a piece of hickory, as I said. A great tool for making tool handles and the such because of its impact resistance. Yet it is somewhat flexible. It's one of America's great woods. Oh, let me round this over here. I said I'd do that with a different tool. Okay, now let me finish it up. Okay. We have a nice handle. We have a little finger rest for our pinkies. Uh, the high point of the handle is right about where my palm is, so I don't have to hold on really tight. I can just let the hand dangle. Now I'm gonna put an angle on the mallet head, and to make the angle easy for me, I just adjust my tool rest at the angle I want. Now I'm gonna go back to my favorite tool. Now, I don't know if you notice this. In flat work, we always go with the grain, okay? So we're topping off the tops of the hairs of the cat and not, we're patting them down. When spindle turning, I'm always going down into the center. I never come back out. That way I'm always going with the grain. Now long grain like this, I'll taper it up there. I will never come up because that's going against the grain. You always go down towards the center of the tree to go with the grain. Very simple concept. So you're always going in. Again, if you can see how, I'll, I'll move my tool rest and maybe we can catch it on the top camera. Raise it up. I'm presenting the tool at 45 degrees. So the wood's coming this way and the shavings are coming off this way at about 45. Okay, so here we go. Now if it was a drier wood or a harder wood, I would present it at a different angle. That's kind of what's nice about having the skew chisel with that curve. It gives me some of that artistic control. I can actually adjust it mid-cut. Mid if I'm coming along, I can feel a little tear out. I can go, okay, I'll just change it up a little bit. And you can see how the shavings change. Okay, so now let's take off some of the thickness. curve the tip a little bit okay now I'm going to use my fourth tool to demonstrate this is called a bowl gouge and what's the difference between a bowl gouge and a spindle gouge okay a bowl gouge has a deeper flute okay and notice the sides of it this is called a fingernail cut or a little bit deeper and it has a much more pronounced bevel Okay, that's so that when you get deep inside a big bowl, okay, you can keep that bevel on the wood and it's flat on the bottom. The reason why I'm going to use a bowl gouge right now is I'm going to show you the scraping cut. Now, a scraping cut is just like scraping when we are working with our hand tools. You have a normal plane blade. It approaches the wood as 45 degrees and cuts. With a scraper, we typically can it forward and scoop off the back, or I've got to go with the grain, like that, okay? So, I don't, it's not, the, the blade itself can't dive into the wood because it's going the opposite direction. Well, with a scraping cut, my tool, I'm presenting one of these edges at a n below 90 degree angle. So it doesn't want to dive in, just kind of scrapes off the top. And I'm just going to do that one because I'm going into end grain over here, then to smooth it out. 
So I'm, once again, I adjust the tool rest to my preferred height for this particular tool. And whenever I present it at the less than 90 degrees, I'm going to present it at angle. So it's kind of like doing a shear scraping cut, which means that instead of going at 90 degrees, I'm going to kind of shear it off. And watch the kind of shavings I get. And they'll look very familiar to you hand tool woodworker. Here we go. Nice shavings. Shavings cuts. Same as you would get with a shaver on your hand plate. Again, transferring the knowledge you already have. So let's clean this up some. Okay, and then I'm just going to take away some more of this waste using my spindle gouge because now I'm going with, with the grain. Now obviously you could probably do this faster if you weren't talking through it, but... It, it'll give you a good idea of what these tools can do. Okay, so let's take a quick look, see where we're at. We got a fairly smooth finish over here. I did a little scraping right there, smooth right there. Okay, let me finish up this tail section a little bit. We'll do some quick sanding. I'll show you a trick for for finishing. And into in wood turning, more so than any other form of woodworking, I like the fact that you can't really screw up. Because when you do screw up, it's not called a screw up, it's called a design change. Turn down the speed. This is 100 grit. Just keep it moving. Now this particular one, because I was demoing it, I took a few extra cuts out of the head. It'll probably be a... Let me clean up the end a little bit more. Again, I'm presenting the edge at less than 90 degrees. So I'm getting a scraping action. It's a very safe cut. It's not going to dive into the wood unless I change the angle. Now if I touch that top wing of this tool, the top wing to it, that is at a positive angle, so it'll want to go into the wood. You get a, well, it's, it moves from you, but it's not too, it's scary, but it's not that big a deal. Yeah, what I'm doing is just hollowing out, hollowing it out a little bit so it will fit, sit flat on its tail. Okay, so quick sanding job. And notice I present underneath the wood. That way this dust somewhat goes away from me. You don't want to sand too much because you don't want to inhale this stuff. 100, 180. Two forty. Three twenty. Generally I have a fan going, but for the for the speakers here I don't. Okay, so here's my magic trick. Okay. Us flat work furniture makers, we'll spend almost as much time finishing our projects as we do building them. Well, in wood turning, here's a quick and easy finish you can do. 
I had beeswax. And when I'm doing demonstrations, a lot of times I'll pass this around and I'll ask people to figure out what it is. Because you smell it and you can smell the honey. Basically, they just take honeycombs, put them in a pot, and melt them down. Okay? And the kids like it too. So, we're going to put a very carefully measured amount of beeswax on our project. Don't put too much because if you do, nothing bad will happen. And this will make it nice and pretty. This is actually what the Romans used to do and they probably learned it from, from the Greeks for smoothing out and making their furniture a little bit waterproof. I imagine they probably had a slave doing it too. Now, this beeswax is in solid form. If I heat it up, it will become a liquid form, just like water. And when I'm talking about kids, it gives you a chance to talk about the three states of, of uh, matter. We got a solid, liquid, and a gas. Okay? And all matter will be all states, pretty much. So, right there, I just put a little bit of beeswax on this and made it nice and pretty. You can let the kids feel it. It's all sticky and kind of grody feeling. So, we've got to heat up this beeswax. Now, how did the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts make heat and make fire? Rubbing two sticks together. What I got right here? I got me one stick, and now I got me two sticks. You got to go with me a little bit. Paper's made out of wood. So, I just fold this up a little bit, and here we go. We're going to heat up the wax. Now, in the Roman days, they probably had a slave doing this all the time to make their tabletops, but we got a machine that will speed this up for us. So I come over here, I'm going to place one stick against another, rub them together to create heat, and we're going to turn this solid into a liquid at the higher temperature. And that liquid is going to be absorbed in the top layers of the wood, just like a little bit of water would be absorbed in the layers of the wood. And it's going to color it a little bit. And then we just calm down. Now this time, theoretically, so I'm, since I'm pressing a little bit to create a little bit of heat, if I pressed harder, I could create a lot more heat. So let's see what, if we can turn honey wax, uh, beeswax into a gaseous state. Uh, ow! It just warms up your finger. Anyways. Here we go. So we're turning the solid into a liquid. That liquid is getting absorbed into the top layer of the wood, forming a nice little finish. And think about that. I spent a minute of that talking at the same time. You can do it probably 30 seconds if you weren't talking. And you end up with a glass. I mean, if you felt this, you can't get poly this smooth. It is just gorgeously smooth, shiny. I can see my reflection of my finger in it. It's just great. Okay? There you go. What did we talk about here? We transferred a lot of the knowledge we had in our flat work with hand plane, saws, that kind of stuff. All that information applies to wood turning. Because basically, the wood doesn't know it's spinning. It thinks it's just getting cut. And the blades and all the angles, how you sharpen, all that's the same. This is a great side area of woodworking that if you're doing flat work and tars or anything like that, give it a try. It's a lot of fun. And it can, it can be used in your furniture making for leg, chair legs, stair banisters, maybe even make your son or daughter a baseball bat. Uh, it's just a lot of fun. So go ahead, give it a try if you want. finish this thing off.